Right, let's test. Oh, yes, it's working. Even, even I can hear myself, so that's a very effective. Right, first of all, then, an apology. I've just spotted the type of the spelling mistake, which some of you might be able to see in Muirhead Bone, M-U-I-R. So that's awful. And if I, if I was allowed to uh, permanent mark the Strathclyde University walls, I'd, I'd go over it now, typex it, and uh, change it. So, sorry, my, my poor eyesight. Um, but I've chosen the title. Well, actually, this print in itself, actually, I, I own. I think there were about 60 of them done. Uh, the then uh, curator of the Macintosh collection at uh, GSA, um, Peter Trowles, very fine collector and curator, um, I brought it in to see, show him, uh, having found it for £2 in a charity shop in Helmsborough, about two months before the first fire in 2014. And I knew Peter, and I brought it in before there had been a fire. And... Um, and he said, oh, it's foxed, which is that little brown spotting you get on the print and just dismissed it. And I kind of went away thinking, oh, well, I was going to donate it, but if you, that's fine, I'll keep it. Um, but it, it's a print. There are 60 of them or more possibly in, in, in existence, but I was very delighted to find it. And of course, what's so pretentious, I suppose, about it is that, in fact, only two months later in 2014, we had, um, in May of that year, uh, what was seen to be a catastrophic fire and was told and called a catastrophic fire, and it felt catastrophic at the time. And that's probably very much like the building looked um, in the morning of 2.14, um, after the fire had taken hold in that library tower in the, in, in the west uh, end of the building. So it, it was an interesting one to suddenly look at this and think, well, that's how they built it, so you know, we'll have to do it again um, at the time. Um, What's interesting as well about that is a print really from, from Muirhead Bone, who's, a, who's a, a, a graduate of Glasgow School of Art before it was within this building, um, and a very wonderful and, and extraordinary, I think, engraver and etcher of, of Glasgow shipyards and the city, is that so much of his work was actually done in the smog of Glasgow and, and the fog, and it, it kind of gave a lovely, um, I think, he, you know, he was quoted as saying, you know, he quite like, it softened, it softened the light, the northern light, the very sharp northern light you can get, and it gave these weird colours um, that an artist would look at, the, the yellows and the browns and the, the, the kind of orange glows, etc. Very much like a kind of Ouija turner um, at, at, at time. Um, and this building is, is shown, he's shown this one in sunlight, which is lovely because that south elevation um, bathed in that strong southern light is really one of the very most important things about the building, the way it uses um, and has over its history used light um, and that's an intangible, you know, Macintosh recognised that when this site was offered to the school at the end of the 19th century and the governors um, latched upon it, they were in the McClellan galleries before the move up to Renfrew Street, um, it was that castle on the hill situation of being part of Garnet Hill and the school is still very much part of the hill um, and the community, a lot of students live there, have gone on to live there. Um, and the community itself is full of people who have had, had an affinity, have been touched, I think, by um, Glasgow School Art, none more so than, of course, last year when so many people were um, awfully disrupted by, um, and worse, really, by, by the uh, fire of June 18. Um, so there aren't many institutions that can say in the space of four years there have been two catastrophic fires, but meanwhile, the school as an entity and as an institution has really continued to struggle and to be determined to deliver education and the, the student experience and also work with its its community to make sure that you know that the broadening of the mind and that great generosity of spirit that comes through education is something that continues to um, be applied and extend and expand from that from that site um, and it is very much what we expect of of um, uh, <coughs> of Glasgow School of Art. It is a world known, a world ranking institution and it punches well, well above its weight. Um, I'm just going to leave that on site for a moment because it'll run and, and it's important if folk don't know because actually it was very important in the case of the first fire uh, just how the, um, the, the fire was stopped. And, and what I want to talk about tonight, because I was asked a year ago to do this lecture, so it was actually before um, the current um, the fire of last year. That, by the way, the circular building is Hengler Circus, as it was well known. It had various lives, but that's still there, the O2, um, which is, was also very badly damaged last year. Um, but it, what I'd like to do is, is still talk a little bit about the project that happened, because it's very relevant, I think, what happened after 2.14, um, and the work that was done, because so much of that work uh, at the time has now prepared us 
so much better for what has to happen this time. Um, if we'd had the fire that we had last year, uh, and it was the first fire the school had ever suffered, and it, that would be normal enough, um, we would really have been struggling because so much was, we thought we knew about the building, but so much more was known about the building after the fire in 2014, um, with the surveys that were done, with all the digital scanning, with all the research that was done over those um, three or four years after the first fire. So um, it's a hard thing to say there's a silver lining, because there really isn't, but I suppose if you were looking for anything, the fact that there's been so much time to really crawl over every inch of that building using the technology that's available to us now, um, means that we're much better placed to look at a reconstruction, not a restoration, um, as the first one was called, but a reconstruction. Um, but that's quite an important slide there, just captured, I guess. The, the building is probably, a lot of you do know, was built over uh, two, over 12 years, really. The, the money was only available at the start to build one half of the building, the east half of the building. So Macintosh had designed, um, uh, well, the, the brief was for a plain, pragmatic, building and it was quite Puritan, that's what Francis Newbury wanted, he wanted the, 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 the building to educe, as he called it, I think a Latin phrase, educe art, he believed everybody has art and creativity within them and it wasn't about educating which is something about telling you what you do, it was to solicit, to educe the, the art from, from every person that, that has it. Uh, they have to work hard to attain that but, but nevertheless um, this is what the, the, the Macintosh building was built to do was to create a place where people would be able to explore and um, develop and build on their um, innate creativity and artistic propensity. Um, and what you see there is that when they did get around to building that second half, the second half with the library tower, by that time it was already outstripping demand so they took the roof off the, the first half of the building um, on the east wing and then built up this fantastic long lantern light along the top with more studios there on the east and there on the right, the um, professor studios and the library tower coming in and um, Studio 58. So it's, a built, it's quite a schizophrenic building. The front fitted well with the tenemental form of, of Garnet Hill. It was quite industrial, those huge windows. Um, the back was like a Scottish castle rendered using Portland cement that wrapped around and cloaked the building. So that was the, the so-called cheap elevation because it was brick and then Harald, um, he was working to a really strict budget uh, the whole time, which he utterly ignored. Um, so it was, it was meant to be £14,000, the entire competition. The first half got built for 14000 which ended up being 21. By the time they'd finished the entire scheme, it was £42 million, um, which is, sorry, not million, thousands. <laughs> um, it's extraordinary what you could do in those days with, with £42,000. Um, but... Um, it, it had, in the end, four different faces because it spanned his career, and it's undoubtedly his, his masterwork. I'm going to move it on from there. Um, this, this was a fantastic uh, photo opportunity for the building when the Newbury and the Fowler's Towers were uh, demolished across the road, if anybody remembers, fairly brutalist buildings across the way. Still much loved, I think, by a lot of the folk who graduated from them in design and silversmithing and, and whatever. Um, but we had this opportunity to stand back across the road and take a kind of um, corrected verticals image of the Macintosh. And you just see there just how extraordinarily, extraordinarily beautiful a building it was, really. So as I say, within the street itself, within Renfrew Street, it actually fitted in pretty darn well. Um, cream sandstone, it always looked a bit pink, and that slide makes it look a bit pink, but that's just how it weathered. Um, but a, a plain building, nonetheless, um, using... The, the money was being spent on the, the huge sheets of glass there or the big first floor studios. Whenever people walked in for the first time, if they didn't know the building at all, they'd always think, if you lost the floor, particularly after the fire, they thought if we burned through and it, no. They were nine meter high studios capturing the northern light. It was very important at the time, obviously, that um, in, in, in Scotland time, it was one of the very first buildings to uh, non-municipal buildings really to use electricity. Um, and it, it was drawing electricity off the corporation uh, on, a, on a very cheap rate, um, but it didn't want to be switched on at all if they could help it. So during the summer months, they always relied on natural light. But of course, in the evenings, where a lot of the classes were run, um, and where Macintosh himself would have gone if he'd been a, a student, he built it, so he wasn't a student there, um, then the, the evening classes, which really paid uh, for, for, for so much of the, the school to really operate, they had to have uh, the lights on. So it was really important, though, how much unadulterated, northern, pure light you could get into the building for, um, for painting purposes in particular. 
that's what we have left today of that front facade. So I will show you some other images, but just, just to keep going back and forth, if you can keep with me. So what you've got there is a drawing of the building in the, in the, in the black and um, photographic imagery of uh, applied to that so that we can start tracing how much, how much stone we've lost in the second fire um, and the damage to it. So it doesn't look it from that slide, but certainly you can zoom right in and look at very hairline um, cracks on, on that. And we're, we're just doing a lot of the work just now to just quantify how much we have lost and how much more will be lost because without a doubt the, the windows which we lost, not the metal work of them, but the, 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 the timber frames saw these windows uh, and the leaded ones in the middle, um, the, the, when the fire came out of those areas, it very, very badly shattered the stone, which I'll, which I'll show you as it came through the building. Um, so again, just looking at that elevation, just a, a fabulously beautiful, asymmetric, it looks symmetrical, but obviously isn't, but the door and that central line of the double door in the middle is the central line of the entire building. But this is lovely, subtle juxtaposition of um, three bays, four bays, you know, very neatly uh, done, slight slimming of the windows on the right hand side. Um, that was it after the first fire, and at the time everyone thought, dreadful, you can still see the fire appliances still on Renfrew Street there, um, but what we had effectively lost was the library, which is, um, I'm sure you'll know, in the, in the tall windows there to the right of the slide, um, Studio 58 above it, and the bookstore above it, or the furniture store above it, and the professor's studios, and the main painting studios on this side were also very badly damaged, but a surprising amount had actually survived, so although it was catastrophic, um, we now look at that and think, walk in the park. You know, it was, we could walk into the building. Um, we, could have, we could walk along those buildings and, and, and just see what the, the damage had been. Mackintosh never wrote, did a great deal of drawing in his, in his handover, but they are beautifully um, uh, simple and very legible drawings. And they cover surprising details. So it shows where, well, for instance, where um, uh, sinks are going to be in each of the studios, where the ventilation shafts run through the walls of the building. It was a very early adopter. He was an early adopter rather than an innovator a lot of the time. Well, he innovated, but he wasn't an inventor himself, I think, um, in, in many of his details. But he was fascinated with technology and making this building breathe, I suppose, um, as, as, um, with the height and with the scale, and also with the amount of people who at that time in Glasgow would not have had indoor sanitary, and there was things like TB in the air, and a lot of fumes within the building itself because of the nature of the, the, of the materials and the chemicals that the, they would have been using within it. So it, it had to work. It had to really uh, inhale and exhale as a building, and he achieved that very, very well. But you can see here he's got things like the lecture theatre at the top, and then in this basement area, um, he has the um, ornament and the, the sculpture studios down here. So he's within the clay of the building in the hill, really. And this is where he's putting his, um, his clay modelling people as well. So they're kind of coming out of the, the terrain, I suppose, the, the, the heavy work of modelling. And on the, on the top there, you see cloakrooms, male and female. Again, very unusual in its day, and it was something that kind of came full circle in the last couple of years, or in the last year, when we were looking at putting the toilets back into the, um, the School of Art. They'd been long since removed. Surprisingly, no records of the loose. Nobody photographed toilets. Don't know why, but everything else got photographed. Nobody has a slide or a shot or a video or anything, a selfie of themselves in the Macintosh toilets before they were... They were ripped out in the, I don't know, probably successively over the last 50 years and, and renewed. But what he was doing at the time, and this is Francis Newbury um, instructing this, was putting in equal provision for male and female, which was very, um, of its time, it was right out there. It wasn't just about getting men in to do sculpting. Uh, it was about women as well. And even in fine art, it was one of the first institutions where women were allowed to do fine art and, and modeling. And the, the, the drawback on that was always life modeling. So it was very, not always men, but it would be female and male nude life models. And there was a big taboo on that, or an unspoken taboo um, throughout the country on that. And Glasgow was one of the very first to allow women to, um, I think, I'm not, certainly with women and then latterly uh, as well with male life models to work um, from the live, the live model. Um, so it was important that there was female and male toilets. Interestingly enough, um, what we were facing when we were putting the building back again within the last 12 months was the student body rising up and saying, no female and male toilets, of course, we want gender neutral. 
Um, so they didn't want to have the female and male, which was a bit of a, 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 a well, not a problem, but you know, we're saying, but we're doing this authentically, we're doing this as back to these plans, and that was the female cloakroom, that was the male cloakroom, and there was, there was the one thing they were absolutely adamant about, they did not want segregation of the sexes in the toilets. So it, it, it was an interesting revisiting of what Newbury was trying to do well-meaningly at the time, obviously. Um, and these are the kind of students even then, so you can see probably even then they were gonna, they were gonna demand for something different. It, it, we always have to look at that slide and count the number of people and the ones who are actually just models. And, um, and hopefully the guy top left obviously is definitely just a model. Um, <laughs> but there's a few others in there. I think there's four fake bits of people in there all, all together. But um, even then a, a rum bohemian equal male female mob of, of um, young, mainly Glaswegians. And, what is, uh, Glaswegians are a bit further afield, but what is very interesting nowadays, we had um, an event in the building, uh, I have to remember, two years ago, year and a half ago, year and a half ago, where we called it a Mac Memories Tea Party. And there was, uh, um, in, the, in the technical education room, uh, on the way into the building, because we had two or three rooms which were not within the construction site, and they were, well, not within the active construction site, and we had lectures there for students and others. But we went through the alumni roles of uh, the school and found everybody that was born uh, basically from, I think it was the mid-twenties. So we went through people and found the oldest people working backwards, is what I want to say. And we had three, no, we had five folk in their nineties. We had a range of people um, in their eighties. And then we went to the mid-seventies and we ha sent out invitations to come into the building and to talk about their memories of the Macintosh being a student in the Macintosh building. And it was a, an extraordinarily privileged event to be part of, uh, where folk came in and they brought their degree show or their, um, their piece of fabric that they'd taken for their, for their, their dissertation, not dissertation, but in the day it was a diploma, not a degree. Um, and they brought in their workbooks and photographs and they met people they hadn't met for maybe 60 years. Um, it was a really wonderful occasion and we had facilitators on a table of, of about five or six people a piece and we just listened to them talking. None of them had a photo of the toilets, which is really <laughs> annoying. And that was the one thing I kept asking, any news in the toilets yet? But no, nobody, no, nobody could have that. But, but, um, but, you know, we're losing the memories of the building and it was really important to us to try and capture some of the things that were interesting about colour in the building, for instance. Everybody thinks it's a black and white building, but there was colour in the building. And um, Audrey Gardner, if anybody knows, is a member of, of various societies and uh, lives quite near to me, who's in her mid-90s now. She came along and she told us what a particular uh, piece of um, joinery in the big studios was for, which I don't think I have an image of, but we, we were puzzled at this kind of flap down thing in the walls of all the main painting studios that we'd uncovered by taking off, after the fire, everything was contaminated and we'd taken off wall linings, basically taken off everything that you see in front of you in a room and found these incredible doors with stained glass in one case. Um, we'd found the, a whole area of racking and um, we kept on uncovering things through the building, which had just been just been kind of, uh, you know, happily encased rather than taken away uh, over the years always. Um, and she just said it was because we worked in easels in those days. We, did, we didn't work as artists on the wall like you do um, from the 60s onwards. In those days, we still worked in the middle of the room, not on the edges of the room, and worked on easels. And at the end of the day, at the end of the class, you'd have a wet oil painting. You couldn't leave it there because somebody might come in in the evening. So you put it into these kind of slots that were flat down slots. Then you put them in, but there was lots of air around them. And, and then the next day you'd come in and start working on it again. But nobody, uh, you know, the things like that had been kind of, kind of forgotten. So that, that is the, um, sorry, that was the, the basement floor. When you got to the ground floor, again, you had male and female uh, cloakrooms because, again, Newbury was really interested in, 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 the, in the having male and female teaching. Here and you have the architecture studios at this level um, coming in also where he felt architecture should be a very functional discipline sitting at the ground floor of the building and you progress from junior architecture there and that long run of, of um, uh, studios there on the right hand side with demountable walls between all of these where you could take them apart and, and run through into larger spaces into senior architecture and only very few people made it up to that senior architecture. You can see the, the proportions are about a third would make it. It's not dissimilar today. Architecture is still a really cruel um, um, industry to get in. And you see in the, in the space of um, 
the two gray areas at the top of the slide, these are the top lid studios, eight and 11, because he was working on a very tight site and he couldn't build everything to the depth of the site. He knew the site to the south, which is the O2 and uh, another nightclub now on Sucky Hall Street, um, were going to be built. So what he did was he, he put them into the ground, but he, he gave them top light and they were two very, very beautiful studios. I am talking in the past sense because I know they've been horribly damaged as well. And when you move up to the first floor again, you've got these, the, the, these are the, um, the fine rooms, the grand rooms, they, they, well, not in, in any ostentatious, but these were the ones with the light. So they had top light from these roof lights, and, and again, these were, were the library and the, the, the museum, which is the exhibition area, and the design room uh, were as well. Uh, so that's the big line of studios, and at the very top, you've got the, the uh, professor studios and the embroidery room, which was actually, strangely enough, my favourite, I'll show you a slide of it, my favourite room, much altered because they had taken the corridor when they built the hen run, they had built the corridor, you see there, um, just above composition room and taking it all the way to that doorway because otherwise you were walking through a class and it had utterly spoilt that very beautiful room. But it was a schizophrenic building. This was his elevational plan at the time, back in um, 1897. And um, at the time he figured that once he built the east elevation on the left there, which um, is very much as it is today, uh, minus a few bits, um, he would do the same on the West Elevation. That was the one he presented to the, uh, to the Board of Governors at the end of the 19th century. They didn't have the money and they said, well, come back and do it again. By the time he came back to do it in 1907, 10 years later, um, the library on the right there um, was utterly different. Proto-modern, um, soaring, jazz modern doorway down in the middle at the, at the bottom there. And, and just extraordinary use of, I mean, this is a building looking to the future. It's not about Scots Baronial, it's not about um, anything to do with any arts and crafts, even in that sense. He's absolutely heralding uh, modern architecture in, in, in this elevation, and it's the most extraordinary elevation still to, to look at. And if, as I say, in the first fire, that was the one that was most severely damaged. And at the back, well, where does that start? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a fantastically mad building. All the windows in the building, there were some that obviously matched up, but so many different windows in that building. And each window, every single window, always had an opening pane. If it wasn't a whole casement, it would be one little pane in the hen run, had one pane that opened. So every window always let air through. The building was constantly getting air through it and, and um, breathing. And you see what he was looking at 30 years later when he's looking at castles in, uh, this is the summer palace of the, um, of, um, the Queen of Aragon um, in the Pyrenees. And you know what was in his mind, he's thinking about Scots Baroni, he was a great nationalist about Scottish architecture um, and castellated architecture generally. Um, and he felt Scotland should reclaim its own, I think, and develop its own um, type of architecture. Um, the, but also very much looking to the future. The reason I put up some of these wonderful images, and these are still with us, thankfully, these images, these are the things that really guided the first um, restoration project um, to, to the detail that we could move to. So the loggia on the top right there, the lecture theatre down below, both of these are these lovely setback spaces. And again, Macintosh, I think, as a man, had this wonderful forward-thinking um, attitude and, and, and understanding, I think, about how an art school would work. So there's a lot of talk nowadays about if you go to Google's headquarters or Apple Mac's headquarters, they have beanbags and shoots and, you know, places where you just have incidental chats in a corridor and a cappuccino, etc. But Macintosh was doing this over 100 years ago. So in the loggia, you've got these little setback bays where you just have a stool, you've got a little shelf you can pull down and work on. And again, outside the lecture theatre, he could have done that as a straight line, but he's just made these scalloped benches. Um, and, and this appears, if anyone rem remembers, the main library corridor with the fantastic full-height timber booths where people sat and smoked all day um, until reasonably a long time ago now. Um, and then the, the library, and, and the, this image of the library um, was taken, we, we can actually date it almost exactly as to when it was taken, and it was about 1909 in the August before the main periodical table arrived, because they're using a different, uh, the, some of the furniture hasn't arrived at that point. We've got the, the bill of quantities and, and the job books for when the furniture arrived, but the chairs are what he had specified for the, for the space. And it was really um, after the, fire, the first fire when this room was utterly destroyed, um, apart from the metalwork, um, th these photographs have, were absolutely essential. It allowed a, a team, a very young team from our, our architects, Page and Park, um, and two people in particular to work on this to the nth degree, to the point that they could look at the archaeology on the site, images of, the, of it, 
um, that had been captured, um, videos obviously, and what remained of the, of the library itself. And we, at the end, at the point we were installing the library, which we were just before the second fire, um, they would say, stand up in a lecture theatre and say they felt they had 98.9%. I don't know why that, but you know, there was always a bit you didn't quite know, which would normally be behind a book, a bookcase or something like that. But generally speaking, they felt they had knew exactly how that library had been built um, from the evidence that we had from photographs such as this. And what you, what we know now is if you see the far column i think people sh not people but you know there was a, a, a kind of common thought at the time these were great big um stanchions of, of of beams of wood that went up and held up the balcony but what we know now is that very cleverly um we know in the, in, again in the job book that mackintosh had wanted it done in oak and he'd said it would cost 400 pound more to do it in oak than pine and he wanted oak and the uh, Board of Governors at the time said, well, we'll think about it, son, see how you can make savings elsewhere. And then he didn't, so they, they said, we can't have oak. But these are, in fact, tulip wood. And there's a piece of, a, 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 a square piece here, a square piece there, a piece of cheap pine running up the middle, a plate of tulip wood and another plate of tulip wood there, very, very thin, like almost a veneer. So they do look, and tulip wood has the, um, which is from the northeast seaboard of, of the United States, um, tulip wood would have been a very readily available wood at the time, um, also one that is known to be the softest of the hardwoods, so it can be chameleon-like, it can do what you want with it, you can kind of twist it into what you want, and you, it takes a colour very, very beautifully, it's a very even grain, and it could be stained to look like oak, so he used a kind of, um, a slightly, you know, a chameleon wood, I suppose, and, and, and he did make that building look like an oak interior, but, and you can see from that, Again, if folk remember before 214, the, the library it was a very dark space, but it is actually quite a light finish on that. So when we were doing the research on it, we found that it had been actually a, a blend of almost oil paint, almost an artist's oil paint that doesn't exist anymore in, in professional uh, painter and decorator's um, kit of parts, but it was a pigment oil that you could rub into the wood. So it wasn't paint and it wasn't stained, but it was like something you'd squeeze out, uh, squeeze out of a Dale Rowney tube, but in those days you'd get in big vats. And I think they can still get it if you ask for it from places like, um, what are they called? Elliot's, is it, on Finneson? Elliot Place, the, the, the paint mixer up there, who were around at the time, in fact, when the Mac was built, an incredible industrial institution that's still um, over in Finneson in the, in the West End. Um, and these images, again, very helpful to us uh, at whatever stage we are. Um, top right, we've got Studio 11, one of the top, lit, sorry, top left. And then Studio 58 here, again, top, top lit, and light from all four sides in that particular tower, the tallest part of the building. Um, so we look at these and look at what he was doing with lighting, which was really clever at the time. So he uses a lot of bare bulbs. He's celebrating the fact, you know, he's got the mod cons, he's got the electricity. Um, it shouldn't be used too often, but, he, but he's definitely saying, here it is, I don't need to dress these up, this is fantastic. But what he is doing in the, in the top studio there, in the modeling studio, is, these are on a system of runners called the Laurie and Inglefield system, uh, which again, we found a patented system, but very, very early use of it, and particularly in a, in a scene such as this. Um, and what you could do is pull them across on wires and group them over a particular object. You can lower them, you can tilt them, you can add shades to them, like the top left shade has got, so you can focus a beam of light on something. So the students can actually work on a piece or, or scatter and work in the far corners. Um, and it, it, it's, it's very simple, it's just a, a bulb on the end of a wire, but the, the way he was using it and manipulating it, and it was absolutely innovative of its time. And of course, very, very shishi and voguish now if you go anywhere and look for LED lights, which are all this bare bulb technology as well. Um, and the bottom left is the embroidery studio I was telling you about. So that's the one at the very top of the building that got added in 1909 when they took the roof off. And what I love about this is the fact you've got three different types of window opening. You've got the top lantern light going north, and then you've got the south light, and he was constantly modulating uh, light so that the south light would have been absolutely harsh at times. So he's punching the holes in that rear castle elevation, and then you've got this lovely grid window down at the bottom as well. And of course, that room has never looked like that for a long, long time, but not long after they, they continued this corridor and took it right the way to the door at the far side, so it, it blocked out that light from that side. And, that's a potential opportunity for us going back, having, uh, it's now no longer, um, whether or not we put that room back and have that fantastic three point of light type of light coming in, which personally I think we, the school should do. Anyway, to take us, leap us forward a little bit, um, that was the opening of the Reed in uh, March 2014. 
everything was good. We just had the new building. Um, it was an international American um, competition winning design for the School of Design. So that's the School of Design. On the right is the School of Fine Art. The board then is where that photograph is taken and that's the School of Architecture. So we had this tight, <coughs> wonderful campus and new public realm betwixt. Um, on May 23rd, that was the first fire. But the fire brigade put it out at that midpoint. They were pretty heroic and they, and I say heroic because not just because they did their job, but they went back in and they rescued the archive, which is essential for us. And they rescued the furniture gallery um, and they rescued a, a lot else beside and they helped students go in because it was the start of the degree show. But nevertheless, there was a lot of devastation at the time. That was the hen run. Um, that was the library, but we could stand on a floor and look in at the library at that point. Um, and that was it when all the archaeological excavation had happened within the space. Um, and the, and, the, and the, the ladder beams had been put up around the windows, which were, again, badly damaged. And these are these pillars which we began to unpick and realise how they'd been put together and made, and just other things. And, 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 and once the building had been cleaned and taken back, obviously a lot of sadness and a lot of loss, but it was still substantially there, and it was very badly beaten up in that corner, indeed. Um, and you can't underestimate the loss of both the library and the store above, which had furniture and paintings in it, but um, it was a... 20% of the building, probably, is what was affected. Um, and even then, there were survivals. This is from the library, extraordinary in, in the inferno that it was, but still some things had survived. The textiles uh, were down in the basement, and the whole archive was evacuated, thankfully, so everything came out, and they were dried across the road in the, in the Reed building before being repackaged and put together. And it revealed things to us, because I mentioned about the... Um, the, the walls and the studios that they, they were removable and it, the old plans you could see it's not it's actually quite fuzzy is it on the slide but um, but what you're looking at there is these these walls over the years as Macintosh had designed are just single planks that go up to a downstand where the lath and plaster is above but you could take them out so you could move through one room to another room to another room if you wanted to have three large rooms or you could have two and one or three individual ones but over the years they'd been plasterboarded over and then services had put onto them and fixed in place and sockets. So they just fixed into that, into those spaces. And in putting the building back, we were going, to, we were going back to Macintosh's flexibility. Again, very forward thinking, very um, modern in his flexible space where you could just pull back walls and have large events happening in them or five-a-side football matches or whatever you, whatever you cared for. Um, and other spaces, again, this is on the, on the east side, so it wasn't affected by the fire. You know, the stairwells on the right side, we had a lot of soot damage, um, but they're hard surfaces. This is the uh, Glasgow marble, so-called, and it was where Macintosh, again, working on that budget, was doing nothing fancy, but he was doing a kind of Roman cement. It was actually known as Keynes cement, and it's still called that in America. And we'd found out it has alum, aluminium, al alum in the mix, and it's made up of a quite a, a rough scratch coat and a very, very thin, very fine uh, top coat of this keen cement, which you polish with the, with the, with the palette effectively, and you just get this lovely um, rendered cement finish. So we had found out how to do that again and repair it and also to clean it. And they, they, they're big, hard surfaces, you know, so we could work with them. And, and these spaces, again, are absolutely sculptural um, in how he had... Um, how he designed them. That's again, you can see it's on the, on the, um, on the east side, and that's the Mac room window. So that, if you remember from the animated model, that's when he had to add a staircase on on both sides for the new floor. So this would have been an outside window. It became an inside window, but extraordinarily done. I mean, I don't know anybody else who could have handled that with such panache to actually build a staircase up the front of your building and make it so a thing of beauty in its own right. Um, this is probably one of the sentiments that had guided us at the first fire. Um, in so far as we lost a lot of material, but we felt we could get under the skin very much of the man and of his thinking and what the, the intent had been in, in how he'd built the building. And that we felt if we studied that well enough and hard enough, and I don't mean myself by that, but you know, a host of people from our archives and researchers and the architects and the engineers. But if we brought that together, we could rebuild this building. And of course, a lot of the questions at the time, even more so now, were, you know, do you want to rebuild the library? Why would you do that? Because it's gone, it's gone, it's a moment in time, and you'd do something modern now, you'd get in a modern architect to do something. And I think the school at the time felt, well, it had just finished its big, um, you know, expedition and adventure into modern architecture with the Reed Building. It had got that out of its system, and that's sitting there very beautifully. Um, the Mac was a room in a, in a 
glorious house that it had lost and you wouldn't redesign that completely if you didn't want to you know if you loved the room you'd bring the room back we had all the drawings um as we said at the time Macintosh never actually built it he wasn't the man with the saw or the nail or the, or the hammer he designed it we still had the designs and we felt new craftspeople could do it if they did it um correctly and with with integrity so that was definitely a guiding um light for us I think is his own words in, in some ways as well um, so the first thing we did was put a, a temporary roof over the building at the time we're thinking about that now but there's so little interior left um, and then um, there's two slides which are quite wordy and it's this one and the, and the following one but they're probably quite important we had to look in terms of conservation just what is the right thing to do and the, and the answer is there's no one right thing to do um, it, it's not it's too complex for that um, but we worked through one of the, the best known of the conservation charters, and there have been others since, certainly, but the borough charter still, I think, holds uh, true very strongly in that you can restore something. You must never um, fake anything up. You should only do it if you have enough evidence to do what you're doing. Um, and it's appropriate where you've, you, you have something of such cultural significance to actually try and bring that thing back, and even to impart back into it the use that it had before. So the various things there that talk about where you should reconstruct, where you can adapt, um, where you can insert new work and where you just repair what you've got very carefully or and, and in some cases, you know, make it very obvious indeed what you're doing in terms of the, the repair. And, and, the, and the kind of, the, there are various places where we did do repair. Um, the majority of the building was actually repair because so little had been really damaged, uh, a lot of smoke damage, but other than that, it was about bringing it lovingly back, I think. Um, there was a lot of reinstatement of things like, for instance, that had been lost over the years, so the plaster work had been lost in a lot of the, of the um, studios and in the ceilings where they'd come down over the years perhaps and been put back up in plasterboard or there'd been new services riddled through. Um, and we worked with incredible subcontractors, which we'd hoped to have back in, to, and I'll show you some slides, you know, to put in some really wonderful, beautiful plaster work. And those skills are still with us to, to do that. Um, there was a lot of conservation of, of fabric we had and, and the sculptures there which were still left within the building. We lost about three or four the first time. We've lost more in this fire because some couldn't leave the building, so about 20 to 30 were lost this time. And that's in itself tragic. I mean, a lot of these sculptures are held in places like the Louvre. Um, we have, um, we have we've an, a, a, a request in at the moment to go and uh, plaster of Paris one of their sculptures. I'm sure they'll tell us to take a hike, but we just thought we'll ask anyway and see if we can take some moulds. Um, but Edinburgh College of Art, for instance, they have their sculpture coat, and a lot of them are duplicates, and they were sent around the art schools at the time. Um, so, uh, but the ones that we had, we did a lot of conservation work. So um, I'll, sh I'll show you one again just a little bit, bit, bit later. And some were entirely reproduced. Things at the library were starting from scratch, but were, were being done with such attention and love. And we had the new technology to help us through this project, which was still is a, is a, is a reserve now of information that's computer held of billions of pieces of data that have all been put into a, um, a computer model which will help us. So again, that was the, the view after fire number one. The building was, so you wouldn't kind of almost have known, but you, you could. These windows were later additions anyway in the 19, um, about 1948. Um, there had been hopper windows that opened in and they'd become casement windows. You can see the kind of vertical windows. So we were changing those back and those windows had just started to get uh, installed in, in 2018. Uh, to the original profiles and they would have made a stunning new difference I think to the building. Um, uh, wonderful work at the time, all aided by the invaluable um, addition of the, of the national drink obviously and, and the, the, this was constantly found, it was like the traffic cone on Wellington on the, on the site and we kept on taking them away but I think it became a kind of game with the, with the seal guys, not the masons, they didn't like it but they were winding up the seal guys. but it was mainly one or two stonemasons who were consistently on this job because the main area of stonework damage was over at the, the library end. And um, some lovely apprenticeship work done as well during, during the project. So this is the roof going back on in the first proje project. Um, and that was the uh, same room with its timbers going in. Uh, the fireplace is all that had survived. And that was just before the fire occurred. So the the uh, roof timbers had been darkened down, the, the t chimneys had been plastered again. This is the professor's um, uh, studios up at the top floor and the fantastic Douglas fir planks, beautiful planks, which were smooth on one side and rough on the other. 
and the joiners were furious because they were being told to use the rough side and put the smooth against the wall and they wanted but that's how Macintosh had it it was very rough it was called rough from the saw plain from the saw plank and that's what was being used this is the roof going on on studio 58 and again extraordinary um, work here with scaffolders working with riggers working with glazers working with stonemasons to cut pockets into the gables uh, working obviously with these fantastic um, jo joiners jcg uh, from dunfermline um, and lifting in these massive bulks of timber um, the harling was being finished um, using portland cement again we would looked at using other materials but actually the portland cement worked well and um, put all put it all on together it was it was coming out very very beautifully um, rooms like this again the plaster works so this is the architecture studio on the ground floor and notice things like Macintosh and there's no doubt about it his obsession with not breaking the light so those tables will have been designed or specified by him they do not break the sill height of the windows around it um, uh, everything it was down to that level of detail and again his slung lighting but very very simple good uh, and um, timber floors above with lovely soft plaster work uh, that was it after the first fire so it's, it's still there that was it just before the fire again just lovely plaster work going in and ironically and sadly that is the mist suppression system pipes that have to be obviously exterior to the the fabric which would have did rather spoil it but were um, necessary <laughs> um, and if you look at things like Euston station you can see you know he was again very much a forerunner of the simplicity and the beauty of that kind of uh, work the loggia, new timbers going in, uh, glass being put back into loggia, the henron, that was it, um, not, that was it having been altered. You can see the, the flashing discoloration there at the, at the top of the, the roof, and that's because the roof had been raised, because some of his details were not great all the time. And on that one, he had a quite a flat roof originally, but we hadn't realised it until we took it off, and because it had been so badly destroyed, and realised there was a lower line to that. And we can see that from the photo on the right. So we, at the same time, found photographs in the archives that not just showed us that the roof was much flatter than the probably better at shedding water version that's on the left, um, but they also had these lovely converging verticals. So not just the, the wall had, um, had, had astragals going along it, but the ceiling did as well. And what that does is create a kind of infinity tunnel. So the whole building very much... Um, very much was a tool for teaching. You would sit in the corridor and you could t draw a vanishing point. And when we started to put the, the, all of it back again, and you can see that with the, with the original pitch put in, it still has a pitch, but it's only about two and a half degrees, not, not seven degrees. Um, you can see that when the sun's coming through, this is due south, you've got a grid there and you can start looking at perspective and how to measure and draw things at a distance. And it was all about teaching you things like this. And again, when we started looking at um, through the archives in the Hunterian, now in the Calvin Hall, um, they allowed us in just before. And there was a detail that this is as the building is, um, but we found his drawings in the archive. And they actually show this slanted detail at the top there by Professor Studio. Um, and we thought, well, that again is a better detail. Actually, that, that will shed the water. What it wouldn't do is allow the professors to sit there and look at the window. Um, <laughs> So whether or not there was a, a change, we don't know, but certainly the detail was a flat one. And again, similarly, this is the building um, after the first fire in studios that weren't affected, but there were maintenance issues. So that's kind of tape across one of the windows where it cracked and the top of the studios. But when we got into those areas, we found that again, that grid had been in his drawings. And so these were going back in patent roof lights with the grid again. Everything was made up of this square, this module in the square throughout the building. Oh, I don't know what that is. Um, the, the main corridors were being stripped back to this lovely honey-coloured um, wood, which we knew was now the original colour of the wood. Um, studio 58 had got new timbers coming in. That was a dark studio, and you can see the roof timbers there again. I don't know why, but it was, it was darker, but the, the bulks of timber there, the big, um, nine, over nine metre high um, uh, uh, timbers were actually from a mill in Massachusetts that were floor joists, and they were brought in to form the beams, the four posts in, in this very Japanese style studio. And they would have been um, uh, of, a, of a mill of exactly the same date as the building, so it felt the right thing to do. Um, and I think I've called that the shock of the new, because when that, and again, you know, look at the lining through of light and, and the sills there, there's no doubt, that there was a lot of discussion over things like the chairs, because the chairs were a little bit low, not for somebody like of my stature, but for bigger people, abnormally tall people. Um, <laughs> um, 
they would have found those quite low by about two and a half inches from a standard chair but they were all about fitting against that sill he worked down from the sill down and that was the height of your chair he didn't work from the floor up and what your legs were doing there was nothing to do with that and of course over the time that you can see how dark the library is just before the fire um back i think this is about 212 this image is taken and um and you can see the chairs that him had been moved around and switched around a little bit but this is the prototype bay that we had built by the very excellent Edinburgh-based um, cab cabinet makers that were doing it. So we asked them to do a full height bay. Now this bay will probably come back to the school quite shortly and be put into the rebuilding. And they'd looked at the analysis of the paint. Um, they'd looked at the carved details. And this is the colour the library would have been, we think, originally. So it would have been shocking for folk to come back into the building Easter this year because it would have looked very different to what we saw there. But we do think that's it, how it was originally. And it would have darkened over time with the effect of light, but also through, I think, the school itself had, had, had you know, painted it or varnished it in, in a different way. Um, and these lovely balusters were coming back um, as well. And, and this fantastic skills of one man doing all these lovely pendants who's finishing that work anyway. None of the carved detail was brought on site, thankfully. So that's still out in a warehouse somewhere. Um, and we'll come back. So very quickly, the second fire um, uh, was appalling. Um, this is taken from the roof of Blythewood, where my office is, uh, Blythewood School of Residence, um, by a student. That was not long after the call was made. So the speed and the intensity of that fire, you see the museum down there on the left with the little four peoples. We're looking at the, only the eastern side of the building at this point. Um, but it's an appalling fire. Uh, really appalling and the next day that was the scene from the air the entirety of the building and the O2 arena as well that you can see the circular form there behind it taken out um, we were very quickly on the scene with the, the scanning equipment that had happened in the first fire now much augmented so we were very quickly able to say if the building had moved anywhere it had in one or two areas so a huge so this is all point cloud data um, that from lasers that's been fed out brought back in compared against the building from before um, and very quickly, a massive amount of scaffolding was put up to hold it, both on the outside and from the inside, from any kind of collapse. That's the damage to the library windows that have been very beautifully restored and finished. Uh, the windows were going in, so they're utterly shattered. This fire didn't just burn on the inside, it, it burned everything. Uh, you know, it was burning stone. Um, so we very um, uh, speedily, the, the wonderful man who works with me called Tom Simmons, who's in charge of craft skills and training, he became overnight the salvage operator and has been cattle tag ear, if you can think what they look like, uh, tagging every bit of stone that's coming off the building, every piece of metal, um, so that it has barcodes and that we're plotting where they come from, where they, where they would go back to, if they are capable of lower down the building, that fantastic jazz modern doorway is um, still good. Uh, it's the only bit that wasn't damaged to that lower level. Inside, as I say, the only thing that survived, it, it, the fire brigade didn't put this one out, it stopped finding anything to burn. So that is the horror of the inside of the building. The brick is done all right because brick is made by firing, but you can see even the steel has given way to the pressure of the heat and the stone is appalling. Um, there will be fines. So in the first um, fire there were fines. It was in the, in the library we found the lights. Um, these are the art school. So we know that, and this is after the first fire, we found these little flat packed bits of uh, metal um, we did it on a grid at the time through an archaeological survey. Uh, those were the rights when they were in situ. Um, we packaged them up, so we gridded where they were found, and then when we got a kit apart, we thought, probably, because the solder will have melted, you know, that all belongs to one. And we found most of the lights. I think in the end of the 53 lights, 17 are composite, but most of them are complete sets of lights that we were able to bring back to absolutely it's not a terribly good image but the one on the right there shows you the lights coming back and then they are burnished up again and the new piece is being made there but um, they will come back and look like they, they're new the brass is extraordinary um, and um, that level of attention and detail things that the furniture obviously hadn't gone back in it was being made off site so that that will continue um, we won't be putting back in the mix and match chairs that were there, just the uh, ones that we thought were original. The clocks, clocks are off site in the archive. Uh, we lost two in the fire, I think, so they're being remade anyway. And I think I'm on the last few slides, actually. Um, Leah Kuhn was one of the sculptures that you can see was very near the first fire. 
Um, he's been lost in the second fire, which is terrible. We had digitally scanned him, and you can do as a project, actually. Um, so he'd been wonderfully restored, and we were keeping the black because we felt that's how he'd become. He had been painted white all his life as a capacitor cast, but after the fire, he was very much damaged. Um, the, he was um, wonderfully captured on film, actually, having uh, the way that Graciela Ainsworth, the, the wonderful Edinburgh-based, again, conservator that was working on this, had to do this was, because she didn't know how much damage had happened on the inside, um, one of the studios, this particular studio, was set up with, when you're in a hospital ward, you get those things you move along with you with the saline drips on it. So they had um, epoxy resin or a, a form of consolidant that was being pumped into him, and he had those by the side of it. So he was, it was like an A&E ward. All these sculptures with these things in their veins being consolidated from the inside. Um, but unfortunately, and he was finished, um, he was almost certainly lost in the fire, from what we can tell. He's not, not sitting on the floor because the floor doesn't exist anymore. He was captured through a, a wonderful virtual reality project. And I've, I've seen it, and you put on the virtual reality goggles and helmet, and you can still walk around him completely and as if he's right there in the room. It's a very emotional experience. Um, and what was interesting at the time was Leku, and this is at the Vatican. Um, he's meant to be the embodiment of human agony. He sees his children killed by a serpent or something in front of him. And uh, we always thought he was marble, and that's why the school always had him white. But in fact, he was originally a Mesopotamian bronze, so he would have gone black over time with the action of, of air anyway. Um, so we can, we can remake him if we wish to. Um, you know, there are copies. This is a little project one of the students did. So we have, a, on the right-hand side, a latex 3, 3D printout from a machine, because we, we've scanned him. Uh, one is an actual plaster cast, one is done in bronze, one has been done in plaster and then blackened and whatever. But, you know, uh, plaster casts are something we will, we will, um, we'll, you know, we, we are able to bring back to the, to the building. It's more about the, the, the spirit of the building, I think, as much as a lot of the things of, of the building. So finally, I just wanted to um, end on... On education, I think, one of the things that we were told by the now director of the school, so I will dump her in it, um, she used to say to me, because she was the head of the design school, you don't need flow sockets. Students hate flow sockets. Staff hate flow sockets because it limits them and they stick up and they trip and or they jam cables in them. And of course, we were having to put a huge amount more services in the building to accommodate what people now need, which is a phone charger, a, a computer charger, a camera charger, whatever. Um, and just, you, you know, everything, your desktop. Um, and she kept this interview. By the time it's finished, Liz, you won't need plugs at all. It, it will be all in the ether. It'll be, you'll walk in and everything on you will charge up. So it wouldn't have in a, in a couple of weeks' time. So she was wrong. Um, and um, we did put sockets in. And I kept on saying to her, well, if we don't need them, we won't, we won't use them. But in four, five years, I mean, the program we're looking at now is 220, 224, um, before the building would come back. Um, it is really genuinely likely that we will not be using sockets. There will be, by that time, the pace, the race of technology is actually far greater. Um, we have opportunities like pulling this building back, which I would love to do that room, if we're going to do it. Um, this was one of the studios we had. It wasn't even a studio, it was the old counselling suite that we had finished. And you can see the amount of wiring that was having to go into it, just to service the building nowadays. I'd love not to have to do that if it were possible and to keep it clean. Macintosh himself, I just want to end on a way, because I suppose I started with it a tiny bit um, with the, the um, Muirhead bone print um, and Glasgow in its soot and its smogginess, which I suppose nowadays is probably what you'd see from space if you looked over uh, Saskatchewan or somewhere like that with all the fracking and, and things like this, with all the um, environmental changes and challenges um, that we have in, in the earth. I think he was without doubt an environmentalist of, of his time. Um, he greatly believed in, in the, the natural and the botanical and the, the living world, I think. Um, and I think, you know, we were already looking at, that's taken of, uh, you know, f of the time when the radiators on, we were already looking at, we were underflow heating the, the library, we hadn't double glazed the windows, that, that was not appropriate, I don't think, but there were areas where we were using slimline double glazing. Um, we will be able to do a lot more this time because there's so little, or we have the skeleton of the building left to actually make this building energy efficient. Um, and it would be wonderful if what we could do is actually look at this building. And if you look at um, 
what is happening through educational and through research institutes at the moment and, and the speed of technological change about things like the glass can now absorb the sunlight and send it into energy through the building. Um, even the render, the, the, the render on the back, uh, there's an incredible building called the, I think it's La Palazzo Italian, Italiano in Milan, which if anyone's seen it is like, like a concrete forest and it's made of concrete that in itself takes the pollutants out of the air. So it takes 70% of the pollutants out of the air by the way the concrete is put together. You can get concrete now that absorbs CO2 in the manufacture of it. So it actually it isn't carbon neutral, it's carbon negative. It will take carbon out of the air in the way that we want the Amazon rainforest you know, to do. So we should be looking at all of this. We've got solar voltaics, we've got um, water recovery. Um, there, there's a huge amount, plus robotics, which I don't want to get into particularly, but certainly the technology of even the construction industry, so that instead of trying to think about what should happen when and the sequence in a program, that can now be fed through incredibly powerful computers on some of the largest projects that are happening over the world to tell you exactly when your supply chain needs to come on site, to absolutely minimize construction waste, to run the project, and you still need the human eye and the experience, but um, it, the, the, the intelligence of that system now is something that we would be embracing, I'm sure, in a few years. So I think, just to end, actually, and it's actually remarkably going to be on time, um, I think, without a doubt, education, inspiration, innovation is going to be um, the future of bringing this building back. But what we will never get around is the creative creativity, I think, of what people actually just people will bring to this and the integrity of the process. So it's the marrying of that, I think, that will avoid catastrophe and that will be hopefully done through the powers of not just the art school, but the, the wonderful experts that have come around and the people who just love, still love what we have left of this building. So thank you very much.